Okay, in the last recording, we talked about this problem, the packed bed uh, with benzoic acid spheres dissolving into water as it flows through the packed bed. And uh, we, we, used, we defined a local mass transfer coefficient and showed uh, that that local mass transfer coefficient would always be multiplied by this driving force, the saturated concentration at the surface of the spheres uh, in the water, uh, minus the concentration in the bulk of the water uh, at each location z in the packed bed. Uh, so, so that was basically the beginning of the derivation. We used this mass balance equation uh, to derive uh, and the initial conditions to derive this result that the mass transfer coefficient uh, must be equal to uh, the superficial velocity in the packed bed over this uh, packing area per unit volume in the bed uh, multiplied by the position in the bed uh, times this logarithm of 1 minus Cz over, over C sat. Okay, so this was, uh, so then we took a, a final condition, an initial condition, and that allowed us to solve for uh, the value of this. And I mentioned that the mass transfer coefficient uh, would be dependent on uh, things like the, uh, the superficial velocity and the uh, packing characteristics. Uh, but it's a bit more complicated than this uh, would suggest. It's not just uh, the ratio of these two things that is involved in the mass transfer coefficient, uh, but, but also uh, the, the velocity of the flow will affect things like the boundary layer thickness and we will get into all of that stuff in a couple of weeks. What I want to do today is to uh, sort of extend this result a little bit and think about what if instead of defining the, the relevant driving force as the local driving force, we instead looked at a log mean of the driving force at the beginning of the bed, that is the uh, concentration at the surface of the, of the particles here and the con minus the concentration in the bulk of the water right here where it's flowing in, which would be C sat minus zero at this end of the bed, uh, and a, a log mean with the concentration driving force over here at this end of the bed, right, which would be C sat minus the 0.62 uh, C sat at this end of the bed, right? So that's another way we could define uh, the relevant concentration difference for defining a mass transfer coefficient. And let's see what we would get uh, let me come down here to the bottom of the notes uh, and resume this uh, at this point. Okay, so now you see um, this is just a re, uh, rephrasing what we had derived up in the uh, when we solved this the first time. Uh, we could equivalently write that expression uh, as C sat minus C L uh, over C sat minus zero. Uh, which is just rewriting the one here in this expression and moving things around a little bit, uh, you get this equation. Uh, we can take the logarithm on both sides of this equation and get this equation. And, uh, and then after rearranging this, no changes here, uh, we're, gonna rearrange, we're gonna rearrange this equation just a little bit uh, and multiplied by the, the exiting concentration. That is the exiting concentration in the bulk at location L if the bed is length L long. Uh, then what we find is that we can write down the velocity uh, times the concentration exiting the bed, uh, which must be related somehow to the flux uh, uh, of benzoic acid into the liquid over the course of the whole bed, right? This is the benzoic acid leaving the bed. There was no benzoic acid coming into the bed, so this must be the amount that's come into solution uh, due to this uh, dissolution process. And, and just, you know, just using this result then, we can show that this quantity must be equal to, uh, to this quantity, right? So what is that thing on the numerator? I said we multiply both sides by the concentration leaving the bed, and that's exactly what's up here in the numerator. So the C sats cancel and uh, leave you with the minus minus CL. So that's just CL in the numerator of this expression in curly brackets. Okay, so it's an interesting way of writing it though, because now you see that what we have is the concentration different driving force at the beginning of the bed minus the concentration driving force at the end of the bed over the log of the ratio of those two driving forces at the beginning and the end. Uh, so you recognize this is a log mean concentration driving force uh, over the whole bed beginning to end. And uh, the quantity that we've multiplied here by is KAL. Uh, which you know involves this packing uh, packing area per unit volume and our mass transfer coefficient, our local mass transfer coefficient. Remember, this is the one 
from the derivation that we did where we assumed that the relevant driving force was the local driving force. Okay, so where am I going with all of this? Well, let me, let me now remember how this quantity of benzoic acid that's gone into solution is related to the, uh, to the total mass uh, transfer flux over the volume area, that is the packing area in the bed, right? So, so the, the amount that's leaving the bed is the uh, volumetric, the, the velocity, uh, not the volumetric velocity, sorry, just the, the superficial velocity multiplied by the concentration leaving the bed, multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the bed uh, exits. That would be like pi r squared, for example, if it's a cylinder. And then we're going to divide this uh, divide this uh, total amount of transfer, that's moles per second, by the, uh, the total area in the bed, right? So that is the area per unit volume of the bed multiplied by the volume of the bed, which is the length of the bed multiplied by its cross-sectional area. Okay, so you can see here that the two factors of A are going to cancel, and, uh, and that what uh, we're going to be left with then uh, is that Na is equal to uh, the concentration at the exit multiplied by the superficial velocity divided by A, uh, this is area per volume, uh, packing, and the uh, divide also divided by the length of the bed. Okay, so this, just by using the formula that we derived above, uh, that is using this formula right here now, inserting this expression on the right-hand side in for the CL, uh, C at L times V, uh, so inserting that into this expression gives you this. Uh, so, so that's pretty nice because this says that now here's my local mass transfer coefficient still sitting there and it's now multiplied by a concentration, a log mean concentration driving force. And uh, so, you know, people commonly identify a log mean, uh, a log mean driving force mass transfer coefficient and what you can see here is that that thing actually is the local mass transfer coefficient. The log mean is just something that comes out of the integration uh, that gives you that exponential uh, for the rate of approach to equilibrium. So, so this now is the moles per meter squared per second local mass transfer coefficient which must then be identical to the log mean mass transfer coefficient uh, multiplied by the log mean driving force. So if you don't have a concentration profile in the bed uh, or if you don't want to make that assumption you can use the uh, the beginning, the inlet and outlet conditions and the saturated uh, concentration are enough to actually identify for you um, a uh, mass transfer rate. Uh, so I have a few minutes left. Let me go back uh, to the uh, top here and do another example. Uh, this one is going to be mass transfer from an emulsion uh, in an emulsion. So we've got these little liquid droplets uh, and there's a fluid around them. Uh, the liquid droplets are bromine and they are being dissolved in water in this example. Okay, so, uh, so we're told only that the concentration in this mixture reaches half saturation in three minutes. We don't know anything about the size distribution of these particles and that's going to limit the extent to which we can find the mass transfer coefficient in this problem. We will see how that works out as we go through. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do now is begin with a mass balance. This is the uh, this C now is the concentration of bromine out in solution around the bubbles, right? So we're doing a mass balance on the, uh, the solvent fraction, if you will, of the, um, of the uh, solution, okay? So of the emulsion. Uh, so, so now the uh, accumulation term is the derivative with respect to time of the total amount of bromine in solution. That's the volume of solution uh, multiplied by the concentration of bromine. Uh, that must be equal to uh, the rate at which uh, bromine is crossing through that boundary between solution and, uh, and, uh, and the droplets in the emulsion. And so that's the cross-sectional, the, the interfacial area multiplied by a mass transfer coefficient uh, and multiplied by the concentration difference, right? So we've got a concentration of bromine that's saturated, that's around the edge of the set of the bromine droplets, minus the concentration out in solution. Okay, so you can uh, see how this is going to, going to go. The volume is a constant. When we divide the volume, uh, divide both sides by the volume, you get an area uh, per unit volume of the emulsion. And so again, that's this little parameter A, that's the, the interfacial area per unit volume in the, in the you know, complex medium here being 
uh, undergoing mass transfer. The initial condition now says that the concentration at time t equals zero is just equal to zero. And so that's pretty easy to integrate. Uh, the final solution after integration is that the, con the, the co fraction of the equilibrium concentration in solution is just one minus e to the minus k a t. Right, so now the time is the relevant variable, not positioned down the bed. Uh, we have a non-steady state problem now. Uh, so, so we don't know anything about the bromine droplet size distribution, and so we can't really compute this parameter a, right? Uh, so this parameter a, remember, was air, interfacial area per unit volume in the emulsion, and, and that's an unknown. So we can just solve for this parameter k a using the uh, initial and final data. We already used the initial data to get this one, and now we're going to uh, use the final data to find this parameter Ka. Uh, so solving for Ka gives minus 1 over t log 1 minus uh, fractional approach to equilibrium. Uh, plugging in numbers, you get 3.9 times 10 to the minus 3 per second. And, uh, and so, uh, so that's an example for mass transfer between liquid and liquid. Uh, what if we now turn and do mass transfer from a bubble? Okay, so if we have a bubble that's originally 0.1 centimeters in diameter and it's injected into excess stirred water, so we're going to be able to assume, because water is in excess here, that as oxygen from this bubble dissolves into the water, the concentration of oxygen in the water remains zero for all time. And after seven minutes, uh, the bubble reaches 0.054 centimeters in diameter. What is the mass transfer coefficient is the question. Okay, so now we're going to have to think about the changing area of the bubble. In fact, we can just make the control volume, the bubble itself, and the interface between the bubble and the solution becomes that interface for mass transfer. Okay, so let's go ahead and do the problem that way. Notice now we're doing our balance on the amount of oxygen inside the bubble. Okay, so that is the concentration of oxygen in the bubble, which should be a constant. As oxygen dissolves, uh, the bubble just gets smaller. It doesn't become more concentrated, uh, assuming we can neglect Laplace pressure. Okay, so we have concentration. We have uh, concentration within the bubble. Uh, this is in the gas phase. We have 4 thirds pi r cubed is the volume of the bubble, where r is describing the radius of the bubble as a function of time. And uh, so we're looking at the derivative of that then is the, is the rate at which moles of oxygen are going into the solution. And that must be being transferred through an interface with area 4 pi r squared is the surface area of a sphere, multiplied by k, and multiplied by the relevant concentration driving force, right? So what is that? That's going to be now uh, the saturated concentration just on the outside of the bubble surface. Uh, so the, you know it's in concentration with some amount of oxygen from Henry's law. I could compute what the mole fraction of oxygen is here and then convert that to a concentration and saturation. Uh, there was excess water, so we're going to assume that out in the bulk, the, water con the oxygen concentration is always zero. This is a remarkably simple equation, right? I've got all constants on this side of the equation. C is a constant. Uh, all of this stuff is constants. The 4 pi r squared that will result from taking this derivative will cancel with the one over there and leave me with dr dt equals minus k c sat over c. Now note, this does not go to 1, right? So the saturated concentration refers to the concentration of oxygen in the water at the surface of the bubble. And this concentration refers to the ideal gas concentration, which is just basically uh, you know, a mole per 22.4 liters. Uh, so taking that ratio with these two things, this you could get from Henry's Law, for example. Uh, and that gives you a ratio of C sat over C, which is just 0.34. And so, so now we've got a rather simple differential equation to integrate. dr dt equals minus 0.34k. Uh, we have an initial condition that says the radius at the initial time is 0 0.05 centimeters. And uh, we can integrate to get r equals 0 0.05 minus 0 0.034. Um, uh, we're going to insert t equals, that's supposed to be 7 minutes, and r equals 0 0.027 centimeters for the final condition. And so that pins down the radius at the final time, radius at the initial time, minus this coefficient with a k that we don't know. And uh, we get our seven minutes in here uh, gives k equals 1.6 times 10 to the minus 3 centimeters per second for a mass transfer coefficient. And that's it.
Today we're going to introduce uh, mass transfer coefficients. Uh, the theory is pretty simple in mass transfer coefficients. You have uh, now, in, instead of uh, talking about concentration gradients as the driving force, uh, we just uh, identify a concentration difference between the interface and interfacial concentration and the concentration in the bulk. And we multiply that concentration difference by a mass transfer coefficient k and equate that to the total flux, that is moles per meter squared per second. Uh, so this of course is moles per meter cubed and therefore the units of the mass transfer coefficient have to be uh, meters per second. Uh, so it, it is often referred to as a mass transfer velocity for that reason. Uh, okay, so, uh, uh, so that's actually not such a um, a counterintuitive term to call that a velocity because remember that the concentration multiplied by the uh, velocity of the individual species was a, uh, a flux, right? So, uh, so you can basically think of this term as representing that concentration multiplied by the velocity of that species uh, and this is the, uh, the concentration difference. Um, uh, then there's this, uh, this velocity term that you have to include. Okay, so, <clears throat> so uh, the, the theory is, is really just that. Um, there's nothing more to it, and so we're going to jump straight into doing some examples. Uh, the first example uh, is this, uh, this interfacial transfer from water uh, into air, uh, where the air is being stirred. So if this was a stagnant medium air, uh, we could just solve this problem using our uh, species balance equation from earlier in the class. But now we have things being stirred and, and things get much more complicated then. And so what we can do instead is uh, to solve this using a mass transfer, uh, mass transfer coefficient. Okay, so here's the basic idea. You have water evaporating into dry air. It's initially dry uh, at 25 C. And the vapor pressure at those conditions at that temperature is 3.2 uh, kilopascals of water. That's, that's very low relative to atmospheric, of course. Uh, the water has a surface area of uh, 150 centimeters squared. Uh, that's the area of this interface across here. Uh, the water initially is 0 0.8 liters of water in the bottom of this vessel with total volume 19.2 liters. And we're given that after three minutes uh, in contact with the initially dry air, the air reaches 5% saturation. Okay, so uh, the question is, what is the mass transfer coefficient? Well, the first thing that we recognize is that 5% is much, much less than 1. And for all practical purposes, if we're willing to accept uh, no more than 5% error, uh, then we can assume that throughout these first three minutes, uh, the air remains dry. And we can take the total amount uh, that, has been that has been transferred into the air, that is the water concentration after three minutes of time has elapsed in the air, multiplied by the volume of the air headspace, uh, and then divide that by the area for transfer uh, and the time elapsed, right? So the only approximation that we're making in writing down this equation is that the uh, concentration difference here, which is represented by this term, right? So you've got water concentration after three minutes minus zero as though the air has nothing in it, right? Well, obviously at three minutes it does have a little bit of water in it, but we're going to ignore that because, um, because it's... Uh, it, it's really not changing, okay? So uh, so now you have, uh, this is the amount that's transferred. Uh, we've got 0 0.05 times the vapor pressure divided by RT. Uh, that now is the concentration after three minutes. Uh, we multiply that by the headspace volume, divide by our area and our three minutes and get a, a, uh, a rate of water transfer per unit area as moles per centimeter squared per second, 4.4 times 10 to the minus eight. Uh, in those units. And I tend to work in moles per meter squared per second, which is 4.4 times 10 to the minus 4, okay? Uh, so now, uh, what, what can we do with this, right? So we wanted to find a mass transfer coefficient. We're not yet there. Uh, so the, the concentration difference, that is the, the concentration difference that we use as a driving force in mass transfer, is uh, the concentration in the air, uh, sorry, this is the concentration at the air-water interface minus the concentration in the air, right? Well, this is a change in quantity, and again, we are ignoring the fact that this, uh, that this is not zero throughout the three minutes, but it's approximately zero relative to this. It's much, much smaller than this number. We only reach 5% saturation over here. 
so, so now we have uh, that the flux, which we just calculated uh, as a mass balance, uh, and the concentration difference are related by this mass transfer coefficient. We noticed that we didn't actually have to do some of those calculations that we already walked through. Uh, many of those terms actually cancel. We could have solved this problem, uh, interestingly, without knowing the vapor pressure of water uh, or without specifying the temperature at which this process is happening. Right? Two givens in the problem were completely unnecessary. And, and so you see that by taking this ratio of the amount transferred divided by the driving force for transfer. Uh, a lot of terms cancel and give me this geometric ratio of the volume of the headspace over the area uh, times the time. Okay, so this is the transfer coefficient, 3.4 times 10 to the minus 4 meters per second. And, uh, and so Kussler makes a note that this is, uh, this is a, a bit slow. Um, but, uh, but that's not really um, uh, so much of a concern, right? Maybe these numbers were even made up. I don't know that he actually did this experiment. Uh, okay, so, um, so Kussler then goes on to use this, this uh, K to estimate the time that would be required to reach 90% saturation. Uh, there's a, you know, this is going to be a little bit uh, less reliable of an estimate because of the error that we made by assuming that this was zero throughout. Uh, probably not not too much of an error, but but anyway, you know, if you really want to know precisely how long it takes to get to a low uh, saturation, then you probably ought to go ahead and include that five percent. Uh, okay, uh, so let's do another example, uh, thinking about mass transfer from a solid to a liquid, right? So we just did liquid to to a gas, and now we're going to transfer. Uh, benzoic acid from solid spheres of benzoic acid into a liquid that's flowing past them in a packed bed of these solid spheres. Okay, so the spheres have a diameter of 0.2 centimeters and uh, the surface area uh, in this packed bed is given as, per, as area per, per volume of packing. Uh, so we have 23 squared centimeters of, of interfacial area per cubic centimeter of bed volume. And uh, so that's an interesting quantity to think about. Um, you know, there's a lot of fascination with the 64% random packing fraction. Uh, and, you know, from that random packing fraction, for example, of spheres, you could uh, go back and compute these values. I'm not sure whether this one is commensurate with that or not. But, but anyway, we will, um, we will move on. Uh, that's really a topic for another class. And, uh, and so, now we're going to, um, to also assume that the water is flowing at a superficial velocity uh, of five centimeters uh, per second. Uh, so that's the volumetric flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. It gives you this number. And the water is 62% saturated after it's passed through uh, a bed of a, of a given length, 100 centimeters in this case. Again, the question is, what is the mass transfer coefficient? Well, now the mass transfer coefficient, not so easily to define, not so easily defined. Uh, we could think about defining the mass transfer coefficient so that we take uh, the total flux is equal to some constant times the initial concentration driving force. Uh, that would be the saturated concentration at the surface of the benzoic acid spheres minus zero, which is the concentration in the water at the beginning of the bed. Uh, at the end of the bed, uh, that concentration difference would be very different. We said it was 62% saturated when it leaves the bed. Uh, so now, if I instead define my uh, mass transfer coefficient to use the concentration difference at the end of the bed, of course I would get a different number because the concentration, uh, the concentration uh, difference has gotten a lot smaller. So the, the best option in problems like this is to use a local mass transfer coefficient. That is to use a mass transfer coefficient uh, that, that multiplies the concentration difference at each location z. And, and what we hope is that we'll find that that mass transfer coefficient does not uh, depend on that concentration difference, right? So uh, that would mean it would be the same, co the same coefficient all the way through the whole reactor, uh, but it's just the definition um, that we use to take that coefficient and get to the total uh, rate of mass transfer, right? So this is the thing, the driving force at each point Z in the reactor is the saturated concentration minus the actual concentration in the bulk at that point. Uh, so, um, so let's go ahead and, and uh, do a shell balance. Uh, so we've got an accumulation term, uh, which is going to be zero because we're going to assume that we're studying this problem in steady state. Uh, we've got flow in uh, to, our, to our little section 
uh, between z and z plus delta z. Uh, that has a cross-sectional area multiplied by the concentration of benzoic acid with the superficial velocity at location z. Uh, the flow out term looks similar, but it's evaluated at z plus delta z. And the dissolution rate effectively serves as a generation term because we're thinking about the concentration uh, a balance on the concentration in the liquid that's flowing through this bed. Okay, so this is the volume of my slice, and this is the uh, rate of uh, rate at which it's uh, it's you know being dissolved in that volume into uh, into the bed. Right. So notice that we've got uh, moles per meter squared per second multiplied by a meter squared per meter cubed. Right. So. Uh, that multiplies by the volume of the bed and gives you moles per second entering uh, my region, moles per second of benzoic acid uh, flowing in into the liquid uh, between z and z plus delta z. Okay, now all the usual stuff follows. We're going to divide by a delta z, take the limit as the delta z goes to zero, and that gives me this equation. This equation is a rather simple exponential with an initial condition that says the concentration at the beginning of the bed is zero. We integrate to get the concentration as a function of z. Uh, that has, has this form, so it's as a ratio with the saturated concentration, so this you can think of as approach to equilibrium being one minus this exponential with K, A, Z over V naught. So it's exponential in position, and we can now solve for the mass transfer coefficient. Uh, the mass transfer coefficient, just solving this expression for K, uh, now can be expressed in terms of things that we know, superficial velocity, packing area per volume, and the, uh, the position in the reactor. Uh, the log of 1 minus C of Z over C sat. So we actually know from the problem statement that at Z equals 100 centimeters, uh, the C of Z is 0 0.62. That's what's flowing out of the bed. And so using those numbers, we get 2.1 times 10 to the minus 3 centimeters per second for our mass transfer coefficient, or 2.1 times 10 to the minus 5 meters per second, and that is a typical value uh, for mass transfer in liquids. Uh, okay, so um, of course, defining what is a typical value depends on the flow rate. Uh, should not depend on what substance is dissolving, uh, but it will depend on the geometry and the uh, the flow rate in the liquid phase that's going around uh, those particles. Okay, so um, you can actually see that right here in the dependence on V, uh, the dependence on the packing uh, characteristics. And, uh, and so that gives you an idea that these, these mass transfer coefficients are going to be dependent on those kinds of geometric factors and on the flow properties. That's it for today.